In the fall of 1973, I built my cabin in the woods in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, assisted in no small part by plans my father had scribbled for me in secret when I didn't even know he was helping me out. He had given me these eight or nine pages of step-by-step -step pencil drawings on the backs of sheets of stationery we had dating back to the Agricultural Institute of Allahabad in India of which he had once been the principal. We had reams and reams of this paper on the backs of the stationery, the sides without the letterhead. Dad had made out these plans in considerable detail, and I'd followed them pretty explicitly. The cabin had turned out fairly well. That was in the fall of 73. The next year, fall of 74, the cabin was more finished, it was all nicely shingled. I had tar paper on the outside. It was about as finished as it was ever going to be, although I didn't know it yet. I'd painted the oak trim around the window frames. It looked nice. I was waiting for the first heavy snowfall to hit, so I'd be wintered in. In the meantime, my parents came to visit me there. They were curious to see this place I'd been talking about, and I was eager to show it off to them, especially to Dad, since he had been the most enthusiastic about it and had helped me the most. So they arrived before the first snow hit. I had made some arrangement to meet them in Wakefield, the local town, but the incident most germane to this little tale occurred on our way into the cabin. We were walking up the trail, and Mom stopped us at one point and said, Wait, wait, I've got to pick some of these mushrooms growing along the trail. A whole clump of these little mushrooms. I looked down skeptically at these mushrooms. I'd noticed them in passing, but I knew nothing about mushrooms. Didn't know the word mycology or mycologist at that point. And I was a little nervous about mushrooms. Mushrooms, to me, the edible kind, were what you bought in the supermarket, wrapped in saran wrap or loose, but pre-certified as being safe, because someone who knew about mushrooms presumably had grown them or picked them. Well, here was my mother, and as far as I knew, she had expertise on no kind of mushroom whatsoever. I said to her, mushrooms, huh? You think they're edible, Mom? Oh, I know they're edible. What kind are they, Mom? She said, oh, they're chanterelles. They're considered quite a delicacy back in our parts. Hard to find them. Expensive, too. My mother was quite a tightwad. Anything that was expensive that you could find for free in the woods was not to be missed. I glanced over at my father, who hadn't said anything. He was puffing on his pipe, as he often did in those days, and was looking very thoughtful, and I thought, looking a little, not dubious, not skeptical exactly, but withholding judgment. He was just listening. He may have been thinking the same things I was. He wasn't saying anything. That was a great advantage to smoking a pipe. It gave you something to do with your mouth besides speaking. So he'd pull at the pipe stem. He'd issue little puffs of blue smoke. He'd consider what was going on and say nothing. That was often the case. I said to Mom, Chanterelles, you say? I've heard of those. How long have you known how to identify these? And she says, I learned yesterday when we were up in Ely. They'd been visiting some friends near the boundary waters of Minnesota in Ely, in the far north, near the Canadian border. Ely, chanterelles. I said, yesterday you learned how to identify them. That's right. And these are chanterelles, I know, because I was told these various characteristics. Yeah. I said, these aren't the, the deadly kind that look like chanterelles? Well, what would those be called? 
I said, I have no idea, but someone presumably would declare it after the person who had eaten the chanterelle that wasn't the chanterelle had died and had an autopsy and had the contents of his stomach investigated. Oh, no, 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 that wouldn't happen here. She taught me how to identify these yesterday, and I know just what it is. She was already busy, down on her knees, picking these things and gathering them into her shirt hem, her blouse, and carried them on up with us to the cabin. We weren't carrying any luggage on this first trip into the cabin. I wanted them to just be able to walk with pleasure and enjoy the surroundings. I hadn't anticipated finding chanterelles on the way. They were pleased with the aspect of the cabin, the way it sat in this little saddle of the rock, the way it had this lovely, expansive view off into the distance since the leaves had come down from the trees by this time. And so you could see way off to the far horizon, miles and miles away, because you're looking down from this slightly protuberant rise of granite rock with soil and trees on it. They liked the cabin. They liked the whole works. I said, I'll go back and get our bags of food. Dad went with me. I carried some water and the groceries. He carried their suitcase. We came back. We passed the patch of mushrooms in silence. He wasn't smoking his pipe at this point. Meditative silence. We walked on past. I was kind of hoping that my mother had, if she had planned to fix something for our supper, it was something that did not include mushrooms. I was hoping. Maybe we'd have scrambled eggs for supper. As my grandfather, my father's father, M. L. Mosher, and his wife had had for many years in their 60s and 70s and 80s, he had cooked supper for Elva, his wife, and he'd always made scrambled eggs for supper. Anyway, that's what he told me. Granddad occurred to me when I was showing Dad my woodpile. I had a big section of a uh, big fat log, about a two-foot section, upended as my chopping block, and that's where I split wood. I put one of these sections of trunk of a tree that I'd cut with a chainsaw, and I put it butt end down on that big stub, and there I would split the wood with my splitting maul and a wedge and sometimes the axe, but mostly I just used the splitting maul. And I said to Dad, I always remember when I'm splitting wood, the advice Granddad gave to me when I was just a little kid. I was maybe seven or eight. And we'd been out in the garage, Granddad and I, at our house in Ithaca, and he'd spotted our axe. And he said to me, Dickie, there's something I want to tell you about axes and about splitting wood, that you have to be very careful. You have to plant your feet well apart and bring the axe down on the center of the log, aim it well, because as carefully as you aim an axe, sooner or later, it's bound to happen. It happened with the frontiersmen, it happened to me, and it could happen to you too. Sooner or later, you're going to miss with that axe, and it's going to glance off the outside of the log, and it could come and hit your foot. And this axe, feel how sharp this axe is, this axe of your father's. He keeps it nice and sharp, I'll bet. And sure enough, Dad had filed down the axe blade, and it was quite sharp. Granddad felt it. I mimicked him. I felt it, too. I was, as I say, maybe seven or eight. I said to him, Granddad, did you ever have that kind of accident and hurt your foot? He said, Dickie, I did. And I was very lucky when it happened 
because I was wearing good, strong leather boots. Not sneakers like you have on now, but I had on good, thick leather boots. I said, did that stop the axe from hurting you? He said, no, not quite. This axe was sharp, and it went into my foot sideways anyway, but it would have gone in much farther if I hadn't had leather boots on. I had to go to the doctor and have it stitched up. It was bad, but it would have been worse. So whenever you split wood, Dickie, I hope you'll remember my words, and you'll wear leather boots too, and you'll be very careful. And so after that, all my life since, to this day, whenever I split firewood, and I still do, I think of Granddad Mosher. I think of his boot and his foot with that ax sunk into it and how much worse it might have been. So I mentioned that to Dad. He said, that story sounds familiar to me. I think he told me about that too when I was a child. I said, do you think he made it up or do you think it's absolutely true? And Dad said, if my father said it was true, it was true. He didn't make things up that way and pretend things had happened that hadn't. In fact, it was true because I've seen his scar on his foot, high on his foot. But it could have been worse. I said, yeah, that's what Granddad said. So we went inside then, and it turns out Mom was already making her preparations for our supper. She seemed to be hungry, and she seemed to be very eager to cook, which was not always the case with my mother. But she liked the look of my wood stove. She already had it going with some kindling I had stacked next to it. She got out the butter that we had bought in town and these mushrooms that she had picked. She was slicing them on the cutting board. I don't remember what else we ate. It might have been chicken. The main grace note of this meal was there were lots of mushrooms in it. Chanterelle mushrooms. We had some potatoes, mushrooms in a kind of brown sauce she had made. And all through eating the meal, there were long silences. I would glance at my father now and then. He would be glancing at her, maybe, or would glance at me. He still wasn't saying anything, but I was thinking it would be more than interesting if it turned out these were not chanterelle mushrooms, because we were all eating these mushrooms. There was not one of us who was not eating them who could help the others, possibly suffering and near death, to safety if the need arose. We would all presumably be stricken simultaneously was a long walk out to where we had parked our cars, half a mile nearly. And it was a good 25 miles to the nearest hospital, if we were able to walk or crawl to a vehicle, and if we were able to hold ourselves together to drive on these not major roads. First it was a timber road, and then it was a good highway on to where the hospital must be in Ironwood. I'd never been to that hospital. It might take me a few minutes to find the hospital. I was thinking about these things. Under the best of conditions, it would take about 45 minutes to get to a hospital. I started thinking about headstones in cemeteries. And while I was feeling kind of fatalistic, I was also trying to see the humor in the situation. Because I've always had rather a mordant sense of humor. In this case, I was thinking a good saying on a headstone for, let's say, over the corpse of Richard Mosier, could say the years 1949 to 1974, 
could be a quote then from the esteemed woodsman such as, I thought it was a chanterelle, or Mom said it was a chanterelle, something along those lines. We ate slowly, savoring every bite, because it was delicious, I thought. I wasn't quite sure. There's a kind of acid that anxiety builds up that makes it hard to taste food sometimes. I thought it tasted fairly good, but it wouldn't be worth the pleasure of the taste of it if it killed all three of us, or maybe just two of us, and one could survive to tell the tale. Sometimes not everyone died of the same poison. Of the three of us, only my mother seemed to be eating with unalloyed relish and pleasure. She loved those chanterelles. I watched Dad's plate to see if he was surreptitiously taking bits of mushroom and hiding them under the edge of his plate, but he wasn't. He was eating them. Maybe he was being philosophical, too, and, and thinking that he'd had a pretty good life. He was, at this point, 64 years old. He'd had a long, productive career. 1974 had been quite a good year in our lives, in my life in particular. I had my cabin finished. I had begun working on the railroad, which I enjoyed. And Richard Nixon had retired in August of 1974. That was the single best part of that year, was that moment in August when Richard Nixon waved from his helicopter, got in and flew away to California, never to return to the White House. That was a wonderful moment. And the morning after our chanterelle supper was a good moment in time also, because we all felt fine, and it meant we had survived and would not be a small headline in a few newspapers around the country. Parents and grown child die of mushroom poisoning in cabin way back in the woods. It's a good year, 1974. Thank mm -hmm. you.